I think we have 70 registrations, but I think we can we can start now. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time today to be with us today. Um, I'm so excited about this initiative because it's the best way to to learn about coding on ICP, learn more about Internet Computer Blockchain through the TypeScript courses. Uh, I think the Merge Labs teams and, and Jordan, in that case, Jordan Lass is the best guy to, to explain, of course, the Hassel book. Um, this initiative is taken by the ICP Hub North America. ICP Hub North America, our mission is um, create a mass adoption of Internet Computer Blockchain in Canada and the US, building uh, projects on ICP, helping different projects to build on ICP, helping developers uh, to improve to build on ICP and, and create new new dApps and, and new applications. Um, anyway, we have now 15 hubs all across the globe in LATAM, also in Africa, West Africa, East Africa, in Europe, Italy, Germany, uh, Bulgaria, Turkey. We have also in, in um, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore. Um, we have in, in um, I think I maybe I forget one or two. Uh, but anyway, we have 15. You can check the internetcomputer.org, all the hubs that we, we have already. And please reach out the near, nearest hub that you, you have, in, and you can talk with the hub leaders there to learn more about internet computer and, and start to, to building. I know here, like, the majority is from North America, from Canada and the U.S., but if someone is from other part of the world, please reach out your nearest um, uh, leader hub. And yeah, thank you so much. We can start. Uh, also, I would like to introduce uh, Ridvik Paliwal first. He's the founder tech advisor of uh, ICP Hub North America. Uh, all yours, Ridvik. Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, as Hever mentioned, uh, we are having uh, multiple initiatives here at ICP of North America to bring mass adoption to IC. I'm the technical uh, advisor here at ICP of North America. And I have been involved with the ICP blockchain and, and development of ICP for over two years now. So if you have any technical questions or you need some technical evaluations, you can definitely reach out to me directly in the Discord channel. Thank you so much, Ridvik. Um, okay, I think yeah, we can start Jordan. Uh, Jordan is the, the founder and CEO of uh, the Mergen Labs. Uh, please, Jordan, yeah, introduce yourself and then... Today is like an orientation session about the Hassel book. Um, and tomorrow we will start the, the chapters. We have in total five chapters, Tuesday, Thursday, during three weeks. Uh, more or less is between one hour, one hour and a half. It depends the extension of and also the, the, the questions that the audience have. But uh, yeah, all yours, Jordan. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Jordan. Jordan Last. I'm LastMJS on Twitter or Telegram. If you ever want to DM me or even set up a video call, I do have like a link opened that where you can just schedule a call and I'll try to fit you in. Um, yeah, I'm the CEO of Demergent Labs. Uh, CEO stands for, I guess, chief uh, executive, but also engineering officer. We're all engineers at my team. We just do uh, software engineering with most of our time. And our whole purpose and goal with our company is to enable TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, GraphQL, and basically, uh, eventually, maybe any of the regular web 2.0 or just you know regular web development tools, we want to enable those on decentralized uh, computers. And in particular, right now, we're focusing on the Internet Computer and the Internet Computer Protocol. So, yeah, this course is all about our project called Azel, which is the TypeScript and the JavaScript SDK or CDK. Uh, SDK would just be the you know software development kit, but we call it a CDK because applications on the internet computer we call canisters. So you know it's a canister development kit. So yeah, that's what the course is about. Uh, I do want to leave uh, leave the course very open to questions. So if you have questions, I would love for you to ask them. You know. Right away, I think it's like it's totally fine for us to pause as I'm teaching, and we can discuss to make sure that you understand. So you can use the chat, or yeah, I guess the chat is good. Or I guess you could even just unmute yourself and, and ask the question because I won't be able to really see the chat super well uh, once I share my screen. So 
I just want to leave that open. And real quick, to just get a read for the audience, um, maybe if you guys could use the chat, how I want to know just how familiar you guys are with ICP or with blockchain in general, if you guys want to just let me know. That will just help a little bit. All right, cool. Anyone else want to answer? Ephraim, is that is that you? Do I know you, Ephraim? Yes, yes. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yo, I have my camera. There you go. Hey. Good to see you. Yeah, see you. I guess like overall, um, I sent you the my club messages. Uh, just like a general overview of ICP, like what's different. This is like for the whole team, maybe that they can chip in, like why ICP essentially. So. Cool. Okay, that's that's good. That's good to know. Okay, anyone else want to share before we dive in? Okay, ba basically, then we're going to make this very, very, very uh, beginner friendly. So let's just start from the very beginning, essentially. So, um, what is the purpose of? Uh, oh, hack the north. Sorry, I'm reading the. Uh... Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I was, I was there. So, um, so let's think about the purpose of what we're doing here in the blockchain space, right? Generally speaking, what we're trying to do is create uh, computers that have extremely high levels of security, right? We want extremely high levels of uh, a property called integrity, a, an application that has integrity is one whose data cannot be changed unless those changes are authorized. So every state change, right, to your database, to your application, to whatever you're doing, will only happen according to the rules of the application and only happen by authorized parties, right? For example, my bank account. That's a very uh, an application many people uh, are very familiar with. We do not want anybody except for me you know, except for you, to be able to change the state of your bank account. So to, to maintain the integrity of the banking application, that banking application would need to ensure that only authorized transactions go through. So we want super high levels of integrity. We also want super high levels of a property called availability. Availability basically means that your application is accessible by uh, those who want to access it. So for example, when I go to the store to, you know, purchase groceries like I just did, I just got back from Canada. I wanted to eat some food. I took out my credit card and uh, tapped it or swiped it, whatever. And within a second or two, the transaction went through. If instead I had to wait 5, 10, 30 seconds, or maybe, you know, the transaction just failed because the servers were backed up or, you know, the internet connection was down, then, you know, the Visa or MasterCard applications would not have high levels of availability. So we want very high levels of integrity. We want very high levels of availability. And really we would also want very high levels of a property called confidentiality, which is basically private, private computation. And uh, we'll talk about how most blockchains, at least the major ones right now, have basically no concept of privacy. So in a lot of ways, we are trying to build the most secure applications possible. And, you know, the whole world has been trying to do this since uh, the advent of, of computers and, and networks and applications, right? Everybody wants uh, a secure application. Um, but to do this, uh, it, it's very difficult to, to really do this using our traditional paradigms when you, to run a web application, you generally speaking, must run that application on a centralized group of computers, like a group of computers that are owned basically by one entity, right? Let's say you want to spin up a web application. How are you going to do it? Generally speaking, uh, first off, what are the requirements of, of your web application? It needs to be accessible on the internet, right? People have to be able to send requests to it. It needs to always be accessible. So if you have a web server running on your laptop, for example, um, as soon as you close your laptop, then your web application will not be available to the internet, right? 
and even hooking it up to the internet on your from your laptop is going to be very difficult because you have to do weird port forwarding stuff on your local router. So running things like on a cell phone or on a laptop is just not going to be good for a, like a web scale application that everybody needs access to. So what you need to do is you really need to rent or purchase or just have available a computer or a set of computers in like a warehouse, a data warehouse, a data center that has very, very uh, high, uh, you know, fast internet connections and where the computers are always running. And that's why we have data centers. And generally speaking, you know, if you're going to start up a company or, or do a project, you're going to use AWS or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud or, you know, Firebase or something. You're going to use infrastructure that already exists that you don't have to set up yourself. Uh, the problem is, is that that's always owned basically by one company. And this has a few drawbacks. One, it's a very large central point of failure if that company, for whatever reason, ends up not liking the product you're building, the company you're building for political reasons, for religious reasons, for ethnic reasons, for who knows what kind of reasons. When you centralize power over the platform that your application is running on, then you open yourself up to what we call platform risk, right? The ability for a small group of people to just shut down your app. Um, also, um, yeah, I mean, it's, so platform risk, I mean, that that's that's a, you know, that's one reason why we wouldn't want to run everything on a centralized uh, set of servers. And Bitcoin really is the first time where we had like, I mean, I would say maybe a quote unquote, truly decentralized computer, right? The Bitcoin network, it, it's it's a very simple piece of software, more or less. I mean, it's relatively complicated, but it's also relatively simple depending on how you think about it. It's basically one piece of software that uh, anybody in the world can run. Like I could run it right here from, from my laptop. You could run it on, a, on AWS. You could run it in any cloud, your own servers, anywhere. And these you know, Bitcoin clients communicate with each other and they create one giant logical computer, right? The Bitcoin network is really one, you know, logical unit when you think about it. But it's composed of many, many, probably tens or hundreds of thousands of, of computers under the hood. And what does this do for computation? Well, it removes many central points of failure. Like, as we have seen, a government can't just willy-nilly decide to shut down Bitcoin. It would have to, you know, totally go through the entire due process and have, you know, beyond due process, I would say, and would need to have extremely good reasons to basically attack the network and take it down. And there's debates over, you know, if, if something like that should exist, right? Like nuclear weapons, we probably don't want those to just be unstoppable by, by governments. But, you know, Bitcoin in some ways does have this property. Um it also has now extremely high levels of availability. Like you always have access to the Bitcoin network. In the worst case, you run a Bitcoin node on your own computer and you know, hopefully you can talk to a few peers and then you have access. It's going to be extremely difficult to restrict access to the Bitcoin network. And then it has very, very, very high levels of integrity because every time I transfer Bitcoin, you have that replicated uh, many times and secured by a very so far a rock solid uh, mechanism that we call a consensus protocol. And so Bitcoin is possibly the most secure computer ever created, right? It's a logical computer, right? It's made up of many tens or hundreds of thousands of, of computers under the hood, but you can think of it again as one computer, possibly the most secure in the world. And where does it derive its security? Basically it derives its security from the fact that it's decentralized. From the fact that, I mean, like, how the heck would you take this thing down? Like, you'd have to go find every computer and shut it down, or you'd have to somehow hack into every computer, or you'd have to find some bug in the protocol itself. Look, the protocol, though, is is relatively simple and has been running for over 10 years now, over, I think, like 12 or 13 years. So just an extremely robust piece of software, which is just absolutely amazing. If you don't know, China uh, made mining illegal just a couple of years ago, 
And I think close to 50% of some crazy percentage, like 30 to 50% of mining was done in China. So 30 to 50% of the actual computers that were making, uh, sig- you know, significantly adding significantly to the security of Bitcoin were basically shut down overnight. Well, basically nothing happened. Like Bitcoin just kept going. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, in my opinion, that is an extreme level of resiliency. But there are some problems with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is extremely slow. It takes 10 minutes to create what we call a Bitcoin block. So it takes 10 minutes for your transaction to even show up, uh, you know, for, so that other people can, can see it, basically. And then it takes probably another 50 minutes to an hour for you to be able to trust that that is correct because of something called probabilistic finality, which we don't have to go into, but it's just very, very slow. And the amount of Bitcoin transactions you can fit in a Bitcoin block is also very limited. Um, I don't remember how many, but you know, it's we're probably talking like five to ten uh, Bitcoin transactions per second or something. Some very low number, maybe even lower than that. So super slow. Also relatively expensive. Like if a ton of people started using Bitcoin, it would clog up the network, and the network fees would go, you know, they they would skyrocket because uh, depending on supply and demand, if you really wanted your transaction in, you'd be paying more. And so, yeah, and because it doesn't actually scale very well, you could argue Lightning might help it scale, but you know, the elegant scaling isn't really there. And also, Bitcoin is not a general purpose computer. It basically has one, uh, you know, one application, which is transferring Bitcoin. Now, Ordinals is changing that. People are starting to store more information and try to do more things on Bitcoin, but it's, you know, that's very early days. And the Bitcoin network itself really doesn't support much uh, actual computation on its own, on its own protocol or network. So super slow, super expensive, and it's not general purpose, right? And that's Bitcoin, but it's also very, very secure, very, very robust. That's great. Can we do better? Well, a man named Vitalik Buterin, who actually went to the University of Waterloo, uh, which I was just at for a the Hack the North Hackathon. Um, he was very involved in Bitcoin, and he decided that, you know, uh, basically you could do better. And why can't you make a decentralized blockchain computer like Bitcoin? Why can't you make it general purpose in nature? So why can't you run arbitrary programs on it? And basically, he like kind of conceived of this idea and thought and thought about it, and finally he would basically came up with the design for Ethereum a general purpose decentralized computer. It's not, you're not just going to send coins back and forth, but you're also going to have programming concepts like memory and storage and uh, the ability to do loops and just basically be Turing complete. And something that is Turing complete basically can compute anything that is computable. And Ethereum, I think, is virtually Turing complete or practically. So uh, that, that was the great innovation uh, of Ethereum was to make decentralized computers actually uh, general purpose in their programmability, which is absolutely amazing, right? And we hopefully are all aware of how successful Ethereum has been. And that's where most of the ecosystem focuses on. And now it has rollups, layer twos, all building on it. And it's just like, I mean, it is like the flagship crypto project, right? And it has extremely high levels of integrity. It's very secure. I would say it's also very, very robust, similar to Bitcoin, possibly, in my opinion, even more robust than Bitcoin. Um, but also, it still has problems with scalability. It's still chugging along at like, you know, I don't know, 15 to 25 transactions per second. And with the uh, layer twos that are being built, we're eking towards maybe a low, a few hundred transactions per second, but I don't think we're even quite there yet. And the Ethereum does have plans to scale to maybe uh, hundreds of thousands ish or millions of transactions per second. But even then, like that is not, uh, it's not enough to run like everything you'd want to run on, on a general purpose cloud platform like AWS or Google cloud. Right. I don't think Ethereum is really intending to do that. So, 
So, so Ethereum even is kind of stuck and limited. And all the Ethereum competitors and everybody, they're, they're all trying to figure out how do you make a computer that is, has extremely high levels of integrity, extremely high levels of availability, uh, also be really nice to have extremely high levels of confidentiality or private computation. How do we actually get one of these things to actually scale so that we can actually build, you know, any web application that you would want to build, why shouldn't we build one of these on a world computer that is decentralized and extremely secure? Like, it just seems like that is a logical conclusion that you'd want to do that. So around 2014-ish, I think, a man named Dominic Williams was first kind of getting into Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and this guy's, uh, I'd say, very intelligent engineer. And he kind of conceived of the idea of taking things even a step further than Ethereum. Uh, I mean, he experimented a lot with Ethereum at first trying to do this, but his idea is let's not just have like a general purpose, you know, smart contracting DeFi thing that's kind of limited to, you know, I don't know, financial type things. It's just Ethereum lends itself very well to that because of how expensive it is to use Ethereum. But wouldn't it be great if you could actually have like a world scale um, computer that is designed to scale basically, you know, infinitely or without bound and basically something that you could just run every single application on that you want to. Right, that, that's basically the vision that Dominic Williams came up with. And Dominic Williams is the founder of Definity. Definity is a Swiss foundation that created the internet computer and the internet computer protocol. And so now, you know, now we get into what the internet computer or ICP is. And it's basically Dominic Williams' set of uh, designs, and I'm going to say set of trade-offs to achieve a massive amount of scale while trying to also have very, very high levels of uh, security and maintain, I guess, sufficient levels of decentralization. And the internet computer does this, in my opinion, through a series, like I said, of design decisions and what I'm going to call trade-offs. Whereas on Bitcoin and Ethereum, you have every single computer replicating every single computation. Right? That's how they're designed at the moment. The internet computer has embraced a concept called sharding. Uh, sharding is a means of horizontal scalability. So instead of every single computer having to, or computing everything, the internet computer is split up into, it's the, the, the internet computer network is partitioned into subnetworks, and every subnetwork is essentially its own blockchain. They all run the same consensus protocol. It's called internet computer consensus. Um, and they all communicate with each other using a BLS signature scheme called Chainkey. And by doing this, by having basically a bunch of blockchains that are all running the same protocol and all communicating with each other securely through a signature scheme, by doing this and embracing asynchronous programming, if you're familiar with async await in TypeScript or in Python or in C Sharp or in Rust, you know, the, the concept concept of, you know, you can have a single thread of execution and then it can basically pause or, yeah, yeah, basically pause and spin off some asynchronous task. And then when that task comes back, you can resume execution at that point. So you can, you know, basically keep your thread always executing, spinning off tons of tasks. Um, by doing that, by embracing that, something that Bitcoin and Ethereum do not embrace at this moment, by embracing that, you can actually get extremely high levels of scale. And in the end, you probably can't scale without uh, embracing asynchronicity. I, I, I've come probably to that conclusion. So the internet computer does embrace asynchronous programming at its core. And yeah, by splitting the network up into these shards, by communicating securely between shards, by embracing asynchronous programming, and by embracing just like a very, very nice developer experience, trying to hide the complexities of the sharding and make it easy to call any application running on any of these subnetworks, just as if 
the application we're running in your own subnetwork. By attempting to do this, I mean, I think the internet computer provides just a unique perspective on decentralized computation. So is the internet computer perfect? No. Is Ethereum perfect? No. Uh, can the internet computer do everything that Ethereum and Bitcoin can do? No. Can Ethereum do everything that the internet computer can do? No. There is a set of trade-offs and a set of design decisions that have been taken. And the internet computer really tries to maximize for scalability and sufficient levels of decentralization and sufficient levels of security. And, and I think tries to go for a very, very good developer experience as well so that you have much more of a general purpose cloud environment. And my company in particular is trying to help with this by building a TypeScript and JavaScript SDK and a Python SDK. So that, I mean, you literally just can write in TypeScript. Hopefully, eventually, we're working on this right now, you'll be able to NPM install most packages, at least most that would actually you know, work on, on the internet computer itself with its underlying uh, limitations or just environment. And uh, and yeah, I mean, the idea is make it very similar to a, a Node.js environment where you just write your JavaScript and get going super fast. So that is uh, kind of a history of, of decentralized computing and blockchains up till the internet computer. Does anyone have any questions now about, I mean, that was just too high level to probably answer uh, every question you might have or every angle you might want to come at. So yeah, uh, Theo, go ahead. Hi, Jordan, uh, Theo hey. here. I went to your Hack the North event and uh, I thought it was great. Um, oh, sweet. Uh, and I was, I was just wondering like the, why, why do you, um, what's the purpose of creating the SDK for TypeScript and Python and why not just use TypeScript and Python? What's the whole purpose of, of I think it's it pronounced Azel Azel, and, yeah. um, and and the other equivalent one, I, I don't remember the name, sorry. Yeah, Kybra is the Python one. Uh, well, because you, cannot, you can't just use JavaScript on the internet computer, it doesn't work. So we, that's what Azel is, it's creating the JavaScript environment. The internet computer, at its core, runs a WebAssembly virtual machine. So this is not just like it's this is not like an EC2 instance on AWS where you have Linux and you have you know just a super general purpose uh, operating system environment. It is a special environment designed for decentralized computation. So at its core, it's WebAssembly. At its core, it has a, a you know a limited set of uh, of capabilities that work in a decentralized environment. And to get that to work, you cannot just run Node.js or, or Python. You you need to do a few things. And so that's what Azel and Kyber are. Does that make sense? Sweet, thank you for the question. Anyone else have any questions? And maybe I'll dig into that just a little bit more, but um, what the internet computer is doing for your applications so let's go at it from this angle. On AWS, for example, if you want to spin up an app, uh, the simplest or at least most basic way to do it is to basically choose an EC2 instance or you know you just choose a computer. You're like, okay, I want a computer with you know eight cores and like eight gigs of RAM and like 50 gigs of hard drive. Okay, you choose those settings and you spin up your computer. You SSH in and you're like, okay, let me just install Node and uh, get a server up and I'll install, I don't know, node mod so it's always running and then I'll, I'll open that port up and hook it up to the actual internet public port that AWS gives me and, and I'll set up some port rules and okay well and then I'll set up my SSL certificate and set up a load balancer okay now I have an app right um, well there's a few problems here one what happens when your EC2 instance shuts down like I don't know what if you run out of hard drive space and then it just shuts down that's happened to me before what happens when that availability center that actual data center like that the actual building loses power uh and you got to start thinking of these things and so to solve these problems you would probably have failovers in different regions or different availability centers within the same region um but what happens if someone hacks into one of those right you didn't set your ports right or or something 
you know, as, as soon as somebody gets access to one of those machines, then it's over. So what the internet computer is doing for you is it is creating a what we call a Byzantine fault tolerant uh, environment for your application. It is replicating the computations across anywhere from 13 to 40 nodes. Most apps you build will probably be replicated across 13 nodes. These nodes are basically servers running in, uh, in the best case, independent data centers across the world, right? Some could be in North America, some could be in Asia, some could be in Europe. And every single computation that you do is replicated across all those machines and they run a consensus protocol to determine that everything was done according to the rules. So what's interesting about this is that if some of the computers break or if some of the computers are even malicious, like if you have a computer with a rogue node operator that actually wants to take down your app, it doesn't matter. Within a certain threshold, which is basically one third, as long as two thirds or more of your nodes are operating correctly, your application, I mean, I don't want to say it's hack proof, but I, it's extremely secure, I would say. You would have to hack into all those machines running an independent data source across where you have to figure out how to, I mean, you, you hack one machine and that's just not good enough, right? Like you, one machine is fine. Like you can take down one machine and it's not going to really affect what's going on. Uh, you'd For 13 nodes, you'd have to, For 13 nodes, you'd have to hack four or five machines to actually begin to do anything. And I think you'd have to hack two thirds to actually push through an actual a malicious change. And if 13 is not good enough, then you know you, the subnets can increase in their size. So the highest subnets right now are, are running 40 nodes. And 40 nodes is quite a lot. Like, um, I mean, it, it, would, it would take, I think, a lot of effort to be able to hack into one of those things. Uh, considering how many nodes there are. And so that's what the inner computer is really doing for you, is providing a Byzantine fault tolerant environment with extremely high levels of security and hopefully sufficient levels of decentralization, though I personally don't think 13 to 40 nodes, it's not good enough for every type of application, but you know it might be good enough for what you're doing. It just really depends. So um, hopefully that sheds some light on, on some differences here between uh, the internet computer and Ethereum and Bitcoin and, and traditional cloud platforms. It's really all about super high levels of security and removing uh, central points of failure. So any other questions before we move on? Uh, yeah, Theo again. Yep. So um, I'm just trying to wrap my head around BFT. Uh, it's, like, correct me if I'm wrong, it's essentially like, how the internet computer is built it's the method of having several nodes running at the same time to prevent um malicious nodes to prevent uh and to increase security and then removing several points of failure is that is that correct to say yeah Am yeah I getting that right yeah um basically the nodes run a protocol uh called like uh it's called consensus it's a consensus protocol and bitcoin does this too Ethereum does this too. Every blockchain is doing a consensus protocol amongst their nodes. And that protocol is designed to ensure that even if some nodes are faulty in some way, that's what a Byzantine means. It means you're just faulty in some way. If some nodes are Byzantine, that's okay. As long as you know the number is below a certain threshold. If the number is below a certain threshold, mathematically, uh, you can read the papers there are proven like security and liveness properties that your application will have. As soon as there are too many nodes that are evil, then it, it does break down, but you at least get within certain thresholds, you get some very awesome guarantees. And on, on AWS, you don't automatically get these guarantees, right? You would have to uh, build in these protocols and run them on top. Um, and, and you don't need these guarantees for everything, right? Um, necessarily you know uh, your blog probably is okay if uh you know it if it ever gets hacked whatever just patch it and you know have a backup but if you're building like a currency for your government or like you know medical 
software or you know things that are super important. I don't know. I don't want my I, I would want my bank account to be like of the absolute highest level of security. Or if I'm like running my government, you know, like for example, the Canadian Parliament, I think is what they have. But in the United States, we'd have our Congress, right? Um, let's say you're recording the votes and you're doing authentication on the Congress people and everything. Like I would want that, or or, or the voting. Like every time I go vote um, for you know my local leaders or, or my government leaders, like. Voting is filled with fraud, and I think we all know that. Um, this seems like if you could implement voting systems on this type of application, on this type of platform, it'd be much better. So, uh, go ahead, um, Negar. Um, hello, uh, you can call me Nova. Um, sorry for my voice. Um, so I wanted to know. So, um, if you consider that expanding the node means that security will enhance. Um, so do you already have a way to um, like um, to maintain this many this many computers that are involved, this many people that are involved if it's better for security? Oh, or yeah. we, we also have to think about that too on top no, of no, no. So uh, let me tell me if this answers your question, but the internet computer takes care of all that for you as an application developer. All you have to do is, you know, design your app design as in you write the application logic, you split it up into one or more canisters. Um, and then you just deploy basically once you deploy all the security, all the authentication stuff and the replication is done automatically for you. The protocol just takes care of it. The node operators actually paid in ICP. ICP is the is the token of the network. Node operators are paid in ICP to uh, provide the to to, 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 pay, to pay for the electricity and and all the stuff they're providing. And anybody here, by the way, could become a node operator. Uh, it, it, it does cost a lot of money, but if you were able to get the money together and find an appropriate data center, uh, blah blah blah, you would be able to propose to be a node operator. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. Any other questions? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Taha? Taha? Yes, yeah. Yeah, my name is yeah. Taha. Um, yeah, so basically, I had a question about generally about the scalability of um, ICP and generally for all the blockchain applications. So. As far as I know, one of the reasons that blockchain actually comes and actually raising is um, basically providing a decentralized application instead of, as you mentioned, a central authority. We have some kind of decentralization. Um, but but my concern is that, for example, after a couple of years, let's say that, especially for the ICP, for example, there are lots of canisters with lots of data usage. So it, I think for the future, maybe, for example, Ethereum, there might be just some specific nodes that can, for example, handle the ar archive or maybe the full node. So again, the decentralization comes to kind of a centralization that some some kind of, you know, specific authorities can handle all those large scale information. Um, yeah, I was wondering whether is this also valid, a valid concern also in ICP or I don't know whether you have any kind of remedy for that or something like that. Yeah. So what's interesting is Ethereum is going to get rid of data storage uh, eventually. Look up EIP four 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 four. I think. Let me make sure that's it. I forgot the EIP number, but Ethereum. If you look up uh, state expiry on Ethereum, Ethereum's plan is to pr basically make all data expire at some point in the future. So you'll basically pay for Ethereum to come to consensus on the state change to provide integrity, but not to provide storage of the data. In fact, um, never in this conversation did we discuss like storing data being a core component of, of blockchain. I mean, maybe that's uh, implied, but Ethereum is taking the stance that it's not Ethereum's job to store the data forever. It's Ethereum's job basically to come to consensus on the changes to the, to the data and other protocols uh, will, will be in charge of, of storing data. So eventually on Ethereum, they're going to delete everything. Uh, 
The internet computer also already does the same thing. So you have to pay for all computation, all network, and all storage, uh, essentially, on the internet computer. And uh, you pay for it in a, uh, a unit or a currency, an asset called cycles. Cycles are created from ICP. You burn ICP tokens to get cycles. You send your cycles into your applications called canisters, right? You send them into your canisters. And then the cycle balance just goes down over time as you store things and as you compute. Eventually, if uh, if you run out of cycles because you're storing too much data or doing too much computation, your canister will get garbage collected and deleted and thrown away. So I, I just want to point out that ICP and Ethereum are both going towards uh, a model of not storing information. Now, or not, not guaranteeing the storage of information forever, at least for free. Now, is that a point of centralization? I mean, maybe. Um, but I think download, like having data available, I don't think is as important or hard as is making sure that the state changes themselves are secure. Because storing data is super cheap, super easy. Like it is not hard to replicate storage. Um, but replicating secure computation and coming to consensus is very difficult and very expensive and very hard to do. So those are just a few thoughts I have on it. Do you have any follow-up? Right now, thank you. Thank you so much for the comprehensive information. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Uh, OK, um, any more questions? These are good. OK, then let's just uh, let's dive in real quick to an overview of what we're going to be talking about in the next episodes. So we are going to dive into Azel. Azel is the TypeScript CDK for the internet computer. Here's the repo. You can go here. You, I mean, you don't have to wait. You can always just get started right away. Um, the repository, the most important thing about the repository is probably the examples directory. So the examples directory has just a bunch of different examples of like all the APIs that are available to you on the internet computer through Azel. And uh, if you want to learn how to do something, this is a good place to go. So there, there are a bunch of these. So just keep that in mind. And then I do want to point out the disclaimer here. Azel is still in beta. We are working hard to get it out of beta, but uh, I just want you to know, Azel may have unknown security vulnerabilities. So just keep that in mind. What I like to do, though, is I like to just publish open source software, give you a liberal license, and you know, give you the information you need to make your own decisions. So you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, a little bit about our roadmap. We are in the process of swapping out the underlying JavaScript engine that we have been using for a much better engine that is more performant, more secure, and more stable. We're almost done with that. In the next couple of weeks, we're hoping to finish and push that out. So also keep in mind that a lot of the syntax we go over today is going to, it, it will change with our new version, but the core concepts uh, should be very similar. And hopefully the syntax is not, like it's going to be like, the same concept, basically. It's just, you know, you'll write it slightly differently. So I just want to make you aware of that. And we'll hopefully record another uh, series to just show the new syntax. We're also working on getting broad NPM package support. So right now, if you install packages, a lot of them aren't going to work. Some of them do. Uh, as we sw swap out this for this new engine, we're going to have, like, hopefully much better support, like, hopefully being able to use things like SQL JS and hopefully any Bitcoin or Ethereum libraries you'd want to use or, you know, having a file system available to you in memory and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, wrapping things up, we just, we have lots of tests, but we want even more extensive tests and maybe some security abuse or audits in the future. So those are things that are coming. These two are coming very, very soon. Uh, these two will probably take three to six months to get. And then... Yeah, I do want you to know uh, there is there are multiple Discord channels. So ICP Hub has its Discord channels. 
uh, they can tell you more about that. And then we also have like kind of the ASL channel inside the ICP community discord. That's uh, where we send people, but you know, there's a lot of places hopefully where you can get help. And then really what you're, what you'll probably go to the repo for is if not examples going to the ASL book, the ASL book is where we're trying to centralize in a good way all the information uh, necessary to get you started with development on the internet computer using TypeScript. Also keep in mind, currently ASL is very, very TypeScript focused. Um, I personally love TypeScript and I think that you should probably be writing TypeScript. But with the new version of ASL coming out, uh, ASL version 0 0.18, we will allow just JavaScript as well. So right now you have to use TypeScript for a few things. Uh, in the new version of ASL, if you don't want to use TypeScript, you won't have to. So I think that's that's pretty cool, I guess. Um, yeah, the, the next, uh, I think tomorrow night, we're going to go through basically chapters one through nine, but um, maybe we can dive into chapter two real quick. A lot of the things we just discussed today if you go to chapter two, it does discuss them more in depth. It really talks about the benefits and the drawbacks of ASL and the internet computer in particular. So if you're curious, like even why blockchain, um, I feel like this chapter is really good. And I try to distill like the key properties of the internet computer that, that make it special. And also the, where are they? And also the drawbacks. So I want you to see like what is not good about this as well. So you can make your own decisions here. So I think chapter two is a very interesting read just in general. And yeah, I mean, chapter three just gets into programming. So if you do want to prepare for the rest of uh, the sessions, I would just try to get this stuff done before. So install Node.js 18, super easy. Install DFX, these are the command line tools for the internet computer. Uh, Definity has made this, so this is also very easy to install. Sometimes on like a Mac or just sometimes, depending on your computer, you might run into special issues that other people don't run into. So it's probably wise to, to jump into this first. And then if you do want to just get started absolutely quickly on your own, you can always just run this command, npm azel new, and then put in uh, the name of your project and it will generate an entire example project for you. And you can kind of just look at that. So, yep, chapter four is basically where we'll pick up uh, tomorrow. So I think that's good for, for now. If you guys have more questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I feel like that's a, a good place to stop. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Theo. Uh, just a general question of curiosity. Where does Motoko come into play? Like, I heard that programming language being dropped around here and there, but I, I just don't really know what it is. Yes, so the internet computer, uh, like I said, it's a WebAssembly environment at its core. So it does support Rust. It does support uh, someone is working on a C++ CDK, just like ours. And it does support a language called Motoko created by the Definity Foundation. Motoko is like Definity's language that they built specifically for the computer. So that is also available too. Also a uh, quick question. My background, like I, I have pretty foundational understanding in web developments, full stack. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, what are the expectations of knowledge? Uh, if I need to do any form of preparation or anything, like, what what are you kind of expecting from from the students in the in this class? Yeah, I think all you need is like JavaScript or TypeScript experience. Yeah, we'll just as long as you understand the syntax and understand like how TypeScript types work, we're not gonna go into that necessarily but we'll basically start from zero 
with with that knowledge. Anyone else? Last uh, few minutes. I have a question, Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for okay, this course is like for beginners in general for TypeScript. Um, once they finish this course, these five mm -hmm. sessions, what do you recommend to do? What is the next? Do you think with these five sessions they are ready to start to deploy like a basic DAP on ICP, or you recommend go to any other sources or like maybe uh, continues their path in in Again, review Hassel again, or what is the best way to to learn after the course? Because the, the thing is, we have five sessions, one hour and a half, but the Hassel book is like more than 20 chapters, right? And, uh, yeah, here's the thing. I think we're going to cover most things in the book. So by the end of these five sessions, I feel like you're going to have a very good understanding of... Uh, how to program in ASL. And that's what the beautiful thing about the internet computer and uh, ASL and Kyber are, I think. Like, there are a few internet computer concepts that you need to know. And I think once you master those, uh, it's relatively simple to get going, at least with basic stuff. Once you get in, so what will become difficult is if you want to make an app that like, truly scales to like millions of users and like all that that's going to be very difficult and would probably require more advanced uh lessons and discussions and such but to get like your basic app off the ground i think you'll definitely after this course have enough information if you want to dive into stuff though it's in my opinion it's very simple you go to internetcomputer.org and you just like consume all the information there and then you go to the forum, forum.definity.org. There is so much developer information in the forum. Like that is like our go-to resource whenever we have questions or don't know how to do something. So internetcomputer.org and forum.definity.org if uh, if you're starting for more information after after the series. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sharing here the, the forum, community forum for everyone. Okay, great. Uh, if it's not more questions, uh, next uh, session, the first chapter is tomorrow, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we will start enjoying and diving more in, in the Hassel book. Today is, it was just like an introduction about the, the course. But um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Jordan, if you want to wrap it up and you want to add something more, but I think everything is covered in general. And yeah, looking forward to see tomorrow the first uh, the first chapter, the first lesson. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you so much, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.